Happy New Year, everybody, and welcome back to the Grid Talk podcast. This is episode number 164, where we are going to be reviewing and rating all 20 drivers from last season, just like we did midway through the 2021 season. We're doing it for the complete season now that we've got to the end of everything with the 2021 season. I'm your host, George Housen, and join me today, we have Tom Downey from Everything F1. Hello. Tom Horrocks from the Monkey Seat Podcast. Happy New Year. Hello. And Owen Medford, who is now a fully graduated engineer. No, so. no, still no, haven't still, graduated. Still yet. not, still not. They, they still haven't done the ceremony. No, <laughs> oh, no, oh, sorry, no, that's no, been no. delayed, hasn't it? Yeah, transform, Transformer Fairing oh. uh, has, uh, has pushed it back a little bit a little bit further. But happy New Year, everyone. Welcome to 2022. <laughs> <laughs> we've gone through quite a few of the grid talk podcast uh, panelists got their opinions their takes we're doing it on an old-fashioned grade system not the number system we have now in, in the uk but the lettering system everybody has rated all the drivers from all the way from f all the way up to a plus slash a star whatever you want to call it and yeah let's get into the grades and unsurprisingly we only have one driver who is in the f category right at the bottom and it is, is of course Nikita Mazepin and it, it's not a surprise at all to see him all the way down there is it Tom Horrocks but at the end of the day I think I mean I think I gave him an E which it shows a slight bit of improvement because at the start of the season he was absolutely abysmal and he ended it pretty badly but ever so slightly better than he started it. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I personally graded him as an E myself as well, but nobody got an F grade. He was, for me, still the worst driver on the grid. And yet, personality aside, he definitely improved as the year went on. He uh, he still never reached Mick's overall level, which you know, overall has to put him behind Mick in a uh, in, in a grade. But uh, he did look out of his depth for, for long periods. And I think we really need to hold off judgment on him as an overall driver until we see him in a better car. But I think, clearly, he needs to be, have someone more experienced alongside him and needs to be in a better car car to prove how good he can be but he was never anywhere near Mick Schumacher and you know Mick was far from flawless as I'm sure we're going to get to later on so yeah absolutely deserved to be the uh, the worst driver on the grid and it's really hard to not be biased and try try not to show that bias as we know what he is as a person but genuinely I, I think he probably was the worst driver on the grid this year. Yeah, I think I think he was as well, to be fair. I mean, we've had some very funky grades from him at the end of the day. Someone, I think Carl went with a U, he just broke the system with that, but he didn't change his overall grade, which was an F. Like you said, he, he started completely out of his depth, wasn't ready for Formula One. In the worst car as well, which really does not help. But at the end of the day, you know, you could have put him in a midfield car and he still would have been crashing it quite regularly, probably as well. But 2022 is a, it's going to be a big year for him, big year for Haas. You know, it's time for the team and himself to you know prove himself as a driver. Yeah, we're not going to get into him as a person, though, because, uh, yeah, that's we definitely get an F grade for that as well, I think. But we'll move on to the D grades now. So there are four drivers in this and we're going to start off with, uh, surprisingly, Lance Stroll away now. Personally, I put him as a C. I think he did an okay job for Aston Martin. Aston Martin disappointing this year in the pace of their car. He got beaten no end by Sebastian Vettel, but he's a four-time world champion, multiple race winner, etc., etc. So you kind of expect that. But for me personally, Lance Stroll, I, I think he did an okay job. He had some pretty solid point scoring finishes where the car was not the fastest. Yeah, he didn't. He, he did a decent enough job. Just looking at his race position finishes, what was the highest he got? Was something like. Uh, or seven, guitar, I think. Six or seventh, yeah. Yeah, sixth, yeah. But for me, I think the difference is, though, that he just, you know, I gave him a quite a, uh, an optimistic grade with the C, but, you know, obviously it's been pulled back down. I just think he just, bearing in mind he's been part of the team and he's got, you know, you'd think maybe there would be a little bit of better feeling towards him, internally at least. But, you know, Sebastian Vettel has had less time in that car and, and done a little bit better with it. I don't know. It just feels like a. I think I think he's also been hurt by the uh, by the order in which they're coming in, but you know that we're going through them. But he just doesn't didn't really excite throughout the whole year. It's you know the, he's picked up a few places and probably been hampered by the car a little bit as well. But just in comparison to his teammate, yeah, he's a four time world champion, but he's still coming in and having to adjust to a new team, new car. Whereas you know Lance Stroll has had has the deck stacked in his favour, and it's just not a particularly great performance over the whole season. I don't think. No, it's not been great. And I think what probably also helps Stroll, hurts Stroll is um, the fact that a lot of drivers have had incredible seasons this year. So if you have an average season, you 
you look a bit below average by kind of default because of that. So, yeah, it, it's not been a great season for Stroll. It's not been a great season for his team either. We saw last year that he's able to put out some incredible performances, especially in wet weather, you know, the pole in Turkey. He got a podium in Germany a couple of years ago too. It's just, those performances are just too few and far between. He never really got the opportunity this year. But yeah, so we'll move on next to Antonio Giovinazzi. Uh, he also got a D grade overall, the Alfa Romeo driver. It's his last season in Formula one maybe ever definitely for now he's been replaced by Bottas and Guan Yu Zhu at Alfa Romeo for next year and and Tom Tom Downey you know it's it's not really something you can argue against at the end of the day he, he did have some very good qualifying performances he got into the top 10 when that car shouldn't have been there but even when he did that he usually spun out or crashed he just couldn't hold it together for regular points finishes which is exactly what Alfa Romeo needed and didn't get yeah I think I might have given Giovinazzi a C but I think in hindsight, maybe I was actually a bit generous because he was not brilliant, let's be fair. Like you mentioned, he did have some highs in qualifying, especially when it seemed like his seat was under pressure this year. So I think if we look back to, I believe it was Zanvor, he got into Q3. I had a, it was a bit unlucky at the start and then just went backwards. But he only scored, how many times did he scored points in 2021? Was it only twice or something? I knew, yeah. he, I, <laughs> I knew he, he came 10th in Monaco. Yeah, it was twice. Um, yeah, and then I can't remember where else he's got so, points. Saudi that, Arabia. Saudi Arabia, okay. Well, that says all you need to know, doesn't it? Tight street circuits. Yeah. He's a nice guy, and I, I think the whole sort of like romanticism of, oh, we've got an Italian driver driving for, you know, because obviously he was a proud junior driver and all the rest of it. You know, and, and you know, obviously Alpha, an Italian brand, albeit a Swiss team, because they're just samba with, a, samba with a badge on. It was too little, too late. And... By the time Guan Yu Zhou came around flashing money and we were waiting on the Mario Andretti thing, which obviously never came through, I think it was just a question of who was going to replace him. I don't think we'll see him back in F1. He's 28 already. He's going to be 29 this year. His birthday is the 14th of December, 1993, because i got Wikipedia open on the other screen. But F1 is a sport which is getting younger and younger and younger. You know, look at how old... Verstappen was when he made his debut. Look at the top teams now. They've got young drivers. They, you know, we've got Russell, we've got Norris, we've got Leclerc, we've got Verstappen. Sainz has been around for a, for a while. He's only the same age as me. He's 27. Pending some glitch in the matrix, I don't think we'll see Giovinazzi back. There are too many good drivers coming through and drivers are getting younger and younger when they're coming into, in, into F1. And the days of drivers kind of getting into their 40s, I think... With Kimi now finally retired and Alonso being the only one who's in his 40s, I believe he's in his 40s. I believe he's 40 now. He's 40, yeah. Yeah, I, I've, I've got it in my head that he is. And obviously Hamilton is something like 37. Mm. We're not going to see Giovinazzi back, I don't think. No, I agree. I don't think we'll see him back either. I think part of the reason why he still stayed on especially for this year just gone was the fact that he was Italian in the Alfa Romeo Italian team um, I know like you said the alternately Swiss but Italian back as Italian brand that definitely helped him out keep his seat ahead of uh, Mick Schumacher for, uh, for last year but he's also Formula E for next year I wish him all the best that you have. like you said I think he's a, he's a good guy but at the end of the day not consistent enough even when he did do some great qualifying performances he didn't see it through and points win prizes and Alfa Romeo they just had a really really bad season and on that theme, we go to the uh, the other Alfa Romeo driver, Kimi Raikkonen. Kimi Raikkonen's last year in Formula One. Um, I'm sure Tom Oryx is about to say very much overdue that his retirement. <laughs> but at the end of the day, it wasn't a good year for him. He beat his teammate, you can say that. There were some times when he did show a bit of pace for the, for the most part. He was kind of showing why he you know, says that Formula One is a bit of a hobby to him. Well, I'm glad you've come to me because now I can really appreciate this will be the last time I talk about Kimi Räikkönen on our podcast with regards to him being a driver. Because, as uh, you say, it's been long overdue for, for a while. I am not a, a, the biggest Kimi Räikkönen fan in the world. It's not going to surprise anyone to, to hear that. Uh, I personally had him as an E. Uh, he was one of the only, I think, only three drivers for me not to score. I, I rated every driver out of 10 for every race, and he was one of the only three drivers not to get to 100 over the course of the season. He just seemed to be treading water all season. He's definitely stayed 
a year too long, maybe even two. You know, his driving into his teammate in a straight line while he was playing with the steering wheel was just frankly embarrassing. And and the pace he had was didn't seem to be there. After looking back at all of his races, there's there wasn't a single, you know, I think it was maybe one good performance, to be fair. I think I'll grade him as a B in one performance. And apart from that, there was nothing else was was really anywhere near. He looked moody. He looked dissenting at every turn. He wasn't the fun Kimmy anymore. He was your embarrassing uncle that you only wheel out for, for family occasions. But, you know, both Alfa Romeos were just woeful all year. So, you know, was it the car or was it the drivers? Because, you know, both drivers didn't live up to expectations. That car had no right finishing behind the Williams in the Constructors' Championship, even without the Spa box office result they still would have been behind Williams so ninth place is just an abomination of a, of a season for, for Alfa Romeo so it's very difficult to say was that just Kimi was it just that Kimi had given up well if he'd given up why did he stay for another year he said at the start of the season that he'd, you know, he knew he was going to be retiring at the end of the season it, as soon as he got to practice why did he not just say well you know do you know what this isn't for me guys I'm clearly not going to enjoy myself this year but he stuck it out it's another year with a young driver out of Formula 1 it's not really gained anything on his legacy it's not really tainted his legacy because he kind of already did that with his life last few seasons so yeah it's just a bit of a I'm, I am glad he's gone so f- for me Kimmy yeah he's just it's, it's good to see him go finally I know he's he's popular with a lot of people but I just look back at his performances over the last few years I don't see a reason for him to justify a position there had he not you know won a world championship in slightly fortuitous circumstances one time I can't see he would have stayed had he not done that but there we go goodbye Kimmy thanks for the memories and you shall not be missed from me but if you are a Kimi Raikkonen fan and you do want to hear more about him from people who uh, who actually like him quite a bit, we did do a special for, <laughs> for ahead of the uh, the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix, ahead of his final race, paying tribute to Kimi Raikkonen and his career. Because at the end of the day, most race starts in F1 history, hell of a lot of podiums, hell of a lot of uh, incredible radio messages, uh, you know. So if you want to go back and, and relive that, I do recommend that you uh, you, ch- you check that out. Um, Don't worry, listeners, I wasn't on that episode. No, I, I made sure that, uh, that TH was not on that one because <laughs> it would have gone down very well. So yeah, from the former oldest driver it, on the grid to the youngest driver who also got a D grade from us overall, it was Yuki Tsunoda Owain. And fair to say, he had, he had the odd flashes of, dare I say, not, not say brilliance, but ve- some very good performances. But again, too far, few and far between. However, he did end up at the end of the season with a good result. He was very impressive in Abu Dhabi. So there's a lot to look forward to from Yuki Tsunoda, but it was it was not the best debut season for him this year. Yeah, two things. Uh, one, I've just noticed that all, all my, uh, sorry, I've just getting on for half the grid are, uh, are younger than me, which is horrifying, that is. And also... Doesn't get any easier. Yeah, and then the other <laughs> thing I was going to say is if, uh, you know, if, if we, I kind of got the feeling that Kimi Raikkonen has stayed about two two seasons too long uh, in Formula One. But I think maybe you can know Yuki Tsunoda, we'll, we'll find out next year, obviously, but he might have come up a couple of seasons too early. You know, he, he was really, you know, obviously he was really great at the start of the season. I was about to swear there, I won't. But he was really great at the start of the season, you know, in Bahrain. But he'd, he'd had a lot of practice there, obviously, with the way the testing worked and, and them staying out there and, and starting the season there. But, you know, it was it was almost immediately downhill, you know, into into the, the bottom of the midfield, you know, you know, messing around with the Hasses as uh, as his teammate just blew him away, basically. Um, and yeah, one's more experienced, but that, that's still... That's still sort of uh, you know a good barometer for it, and and he just kept making mistakes and kept putting in the wall, and and not just through through the races where the points are divvied out, but you know through practice sessions and stuff. And I know that's what they're there for, but throwing it in the wall in qualifying and stuff, you know, is automatically guaranteeing you, you know, it, it almost pegs you back before you've even had a chance to to show your hand. And it's you know there's just so so many issues for Yuki that he's never really. You know, apart from a couple of freak results, you know, fourth in Abu Dhabi or or sixth uh, in Qatar, like you know, he's uh, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong place. Sorry, am I? You know, so it's fourth, got fourth, sixth yeah, no, in, fourth uh, in Abu Dhabi, well. sixth in Hungary. Sorry, well, mm. well that's my uh, that's my camera gone. I'll try and sort that out in a minute. Uh, but yeah, it's just it's just seemed like a just a really poor season. He's he's ascent, he's come back up a little bit, but he's he's still got a lot. Like you know, he's got a mountain to climb next year, and we just I I just kind of hope that you know he can um, he can sort himself out when everything is new with the 2022 cars and uh, and actually sort of and make it 
a bit further up and, and actually compete properly because he's right right now it's just it looks like a, a bit of an abysmal performance or more on, on from someone who had a lot of promise well yeah i mean after the first few races he literally first two we were all singing his praises even though you know he spun off in Emily, he was showing a lot of pace you know with, with Sonoda, like you said he probably did come in a bit too early but Honda maybe knowing that it was going to be there last year once the Japanese driver in one of their cars at least for the final year maybe that played a part in it all but at the end of the day he has a year's experience under his belt next year is very much so this year now is very much a clean slate in terms of the designs of the cars they're going to be fresh to absolutely everybody you know the cars for the last um, last four years or so four seasons or so remain relatively the same with the philosophies and everything so everybody else had all that experience and he didn't. And I think that really hurt him. I think that really hurt all three rookies this year, to be fair, to an extent. But Sonoda definitely as well. But next year, we're hoping he's going to do very well. I I, I really want to see him do well. Because this year, Pierre Gasly, and that's a guy we'll get into quite a bit later in the show, he absolutely carried the Alpha Tauri team this season. You know, Sonoda was not scoring points anywhere near regularly enough. And I think a big grade is very fair for him. I think that's what I gave him as well. But... Yeah, before we get into the C grades, let me just say that if you leave us a five-star review on iTunes, we'll give you a shout-out at the start of the show, as as always, as we've done for quite some time now. And yeah, and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel as well, where you can join that action live, normally live. We're not, we're not going live, out live on this one, at least, just because it's not reacting to a live event. But when the season gets underway again, we will be doing our shows live on YouTube. So we'll get into the C grades. And the first one I want to go through is Daniel Ricardo, a man who actually managed to win a race this year. And surprisingly, he's down in C. But that the thing is, at the end of the day, Tom Downey, I think that's mainly because, again, he's just been too inconsistent at times. Yes, he had that great performance in Italy. But aside from that, for the most part, he has flattered to deceive him what was a pretty good McLaren car this year. Yeah. Danny Rick, oh, I'm surprised he got a C overall. I give him a D, Oof. and I was being generous because um, you were the one guy to give him. No, no, there was two. No, no, two. no. I've I've looked. I've looked. He's he's looked um, at the data sheet. Yeah, <laughs> you and Phil, are the only guys. Everybody else gave a C grade. Thank you, Phil. He has not had a good year. I know he won a race, and he did have some good weekends, which we talked about, but. If you want to say that Gasly carried Alpha Tari, you could argue Lando somewhat carried McLaren this year. And I said it before, and I will say it again. If Danny Rick would have been more consistent this year and had more points finishes, McLaren would have had a good chance of finishing third or would have probably finished third in the constructors. Yes, I know he won a race, and McLaren were the only team to get a one-two, but that is also because Hamilton and Verstappen had a little boo-boo in that race, which I'm sure we'll get to in a bit. He did have good weekends, obviously, because he had to be in a position where he was... Where, you know, if we take Monza, for example, he had to be in a position where something happened, he was there to take the lead. And he was still on course for, for a decent result regardless. But how many times this season did we see him out-qualified, out in Q2, out in the points, getting stuck in the DRS train, not being able to overtake? That, and bearing in mind, Danny Rick, he, you know, we saw it when he joined Renault in 2019, I think it was. He took a while to bed into the team, and then in 2020, he was better. But that McLaren is a step up from what that Renault was. And Danny Rick has been around for a while. You know, he's entering his 10th year on the grid in his ninth full year, or I might even be a year out on that. I can't remember if he joined midway through 20. Did he join midway through 2011? I'm sure someone will correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah. Um, he drove for HRT for the second half of the 2011 season. Yeah, I couldn't remember if it was 2011 or 2010, but no, I'm fairly certain it was 2011. You know, so, so he's been around. He's won races. He's had pole positions. And he's also one of only two drivers, I believe, to win a race for two different teams in the Turbo Hybrid era, because obviously Perez has been the other one. I can't think of anyone else who has actually won a race for, t- for two different teams. Yeah, I'm um, pretty sure that's correct. You're yeah, right, yeah, you're absolutely right. I'm spitting bare facts here. But, um, but you know, he, he's just in a car and a team that is so good. And, and you know, McLaren are really on a resurgence. He should have done better in the machinery he had. Again, yes, I know driving styles have to adapt. And, you know, I think maybe we saw that a bit in 2018 when he was at Red Bull. 
you know, when the car was beginning to be tailored more towards Max, because as we've seen from the 2021 season, Max is the future or is that team. It shouldn't take him that long to get adjusted to a car. Not saying I could do a better job, obviously. I wouldn't even fit in an F1. But his, if he doesn't improve in this upcoming season, his days are numbered because there are plenty of other drivers who could take that seat. And he needs to do better. And his 2021 season, I think if he wouldn't have won that race in Monza, it would be looking pretty bleak for him. Yeah, I think, to be fair, I think on the mid-season ratings, and someone, again, may correct me with this one, but I think we did give him a D-grade overall because that was before the win in Monza. So, yeah, that, that's the main reason why I gave him a C over a D. I think, I think if it wasn't for that, I probably would have given him a D-grade as well. It's a tricky one with Ricardo because we all know how talented he is. We, know, we all know how good he is. He just needs to show it in that car. And I think next year he will do. But <laughs> that's not really based on much from this year other than that one race, but we'll, we'll see what happens with him. We'll see what happens with him there. So we'll go from um, go from Ricardo to uh, Mick Schumacher, who also got a C grade, his debut season in Formula One. And, and again, you know, it, it's hard for him. He didn't score any points. Neither past driver did this year. It's, it was the worst car in the grid by some margin, uh, Tom Horrocks. But he did show he, that he has some decent pace in that car. He did get into Q2 twice, albeit one of them, because of a crash, but I think in Turkey he got there on merit, which is really saying something. The kid has some supreme speed, but again, he just needs to show a bit more consistency, probably. Yeah, I mean, as far as debut seasons go, it was actually a fairly strong debut season when you take into account the car he was in and the, the teammate he had and, and everything. It, it was it was fairly solid. But I mean, for me, the reason that for me, uh, I know he's in the CPAC here, but for the reason for me, he got a D overall was because you can't really judge him based on his his poor teammate. And the car was terrible, but he did make a lot of mistakes. As I said, decent rookie campaign, but his inexperience did show. And there was too many times when he binned it in practice or he binned it in qualifying. And, you know, he was, you can beat your teammate in qualifying by two seconds, but if you're behind him on lap one because you had a little spin and, and got going again then you finish one second ahead of him you know that that's kind of you know that shows just how bad your teammate is but you're the one that's actually looked worse because you're the one that's had the huge pace advantage and still ended up having to pass your teammate on track he did that far too often for me which is why for me he got a he got a d grade overall there's this whole romantic thing about about the name Schumacher back on the grid which I absolutely buy into it is good to see him there I was unconvinced about whether he was good enough, but this season's proved to me that he definitely deserves a shot in Formula 1. He deserves a shot in Formula 1 in a better car than he's got at the moment, which I'm sure Haas will bring a better car next year. Whether it's latched onto the back of the field or just closer to the back of the field, I'm not I'm not convinced either way, but uh, I, it'd be nice to see him in a few more wheels and more battles next year and not just squabbling with his teammate and and just just kind of fighting around at the back and and getting in the way and so but I, again it's he needs a he would it'd be great if he got a more experienced teammate as long as he's in that Haas car he's going to be alongside Nikita Mazepin so he's going to have to kind of deal with the cards he's dealt and try and get his uh, experience and role models from elsewhere because he's certainly not going to get any from his teammate so he, he needs to build on what he's done this year he does need to improve because another season like that in in a better car. And you know, throwing results away, you know, lo- losing your front wing on your own behind the safety car, or or just just binning it into the barrier. Yeah, it's, it's if he's doing that frequently next year, then I think you know Ferrari might have second thoughts about this this great plan that they've got. You know, they signed Carlos Sainz for a two year deal in the in the hope that Mick Schumacher would 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 come good in two years in a as a uh, as like an intern or something at, at Haas, and then come in and replace Carlos Sainz and have the dream team of Leclerc and Schumacher. But if he does have another bad season, they're going to be signing on science long term and going to be cutting their losses with Mick so um, he does need to improve definitely next year but decent decent start and I would like to see more of him definitely deserves a shot yeah 100% and the, th- the thing is as well with with Schumacher is that like Ricardo, and I think it's probably a greater extent than Ricardo. He does take some time getting used to new series. His first season in F2, he was he was okay. He was average. I think he got a few podiums, but then the next year he won it. So uh, again, he's got a season under his belt. I think next year he'll have a I think he'll have a much better year, but he also needs a better car, which I think Hash should provide him with. I'm just hoping they're at least consistent and sorry, competitive, that's the word, because they were not competitive this year at all. If Schumacher had the race of his life, he'd maybe beat the Williams 
maybe but even that was a stretch most of the time it just didn't happen so yeah we'll see what we'll see what happens with Mick Schumacher next year I think and moving on now to a, a driver again probably divides opinions quite a bit there's it was, it was quite a spread with the grades this year another race winner that's in the C category Esteban Ocon Owen I think you gave him a B grade I think you gave him one of the highest grades overall so I'm interested to hear what you think of him because for me he seems like the kind of driver that would do very well just leading out front and dominating a race like he did Hungary and like he almost got a podium in Saudi Arabia with as well. But at the same time, he also had quite a few races where he was caught in the midfield pack and sometimes he finished out of the points, which when you compare him to his teammate Alonso, it's a little bit disappointing in the Alpine. Yeah, to be fair, I don't know what I was. Uh, I don't really know what I was thinking when I gave him a B, because that's a <laughs> like like the thing for me is you look at it. Expert you go, opinions here on the Grid Talk podcast. <laughs> hey, they're transient. <laughs> they can be expert and transient. I think he he's definitely you know he's 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 more of a C really. I gave him a B, but he's more of a C, and, and it's it's because of the win that he gets that. To be honest, in the grand scheme of things, he's he's finished behind his teammate in the championship, who took a year out, who took some years out to go and do to go and do endurance racing which uh, and and a couple of other forms of motorsport which there are you know was forced to do for one but you know he, he's come back and he spent time he's more familiar with these cars you'd, you'd say particularly with the with with the alpine setup and you know and team endstone basically and and you'd, you'd think he'd have his head sorted a bit more but that look at the early half of the season and you know from azerbaijan to austria awful turn of form you know immediately after he got the contract extension for three years you know if i were if i were the lawyers who have been who've been working that out up at you know up at head office i'd I'd be like what have we signed here for three years like he's immediately down to 14th place twice on the trot and you know a couple of the retirements that he's got weren't his weren't really his fault you know the mechanical issues with the car and things like that but when you finish behind someone who is many years you're older has taken time out to do a less demanding motorsport. You're more familiar with the cars. You're more familiar with the team setup. You're more familiar with, you know, uh, the, the, how how it operates and things like that. And you know, there's something to be said for you know Fernando Alonso being a two-time world champion, obviously. But I I just feel like Ocon didn't. He's not excited in the way that he did sort of previously, and you can kind of see why Mercedes were looking for other people rather than him when they wanted. You know, when they wanted him, when they needed to put people in the car, and he just doesn't look like he's got the potential to be sort of the George Russells of the world, which is a shame because it, it feels like that his sort of tenure in Formula One is is passing him by. He's, he's sort of getting into the twilight of his career for how long he's been, and yet he's done an incredible job to get there. But I just don't think it's a, a particularly good performance uh, to finish in the bottom half of the top of the championship given the car that he's got, which, it, you know, should be able to do decent things and, and, and poach a podium every now and then. Yeah, I get I get where you're coming from. I mean, he did only just miss out on the last lap in Saudi Arabia, but I know what you mean. You compare him to Alonso, who has had time out. Yes, it's Alonso. You can put him in anything and he'll win. You know, that's just the way he is. But even with that win that Ocon got, He's still finished behind Alonso. So it's, it's, a, it's a tough one to read at the end of the day. Only I think only seven points separated them. I think Alpine did probably the most they could do with that car. I don't think that car was particularly great this year. I don't I don't think it was at all. So for them to get fifth like they did ahead of Alpha Tari, I think that's a hell of an achievement. But um Ocon's a, a very difficult one to read. It's going to be an interesting year for him next year because you know he's going to be expected to take over the team leader role with that very long contract he's got. I mean, Alonso. He can't have that many more years left in left if he's 40 years old. No offense to the guy. He deserves to be there, absolutely. But you know, time waits for nobody. So we'll see, we'll see how Alonso gets on in the next few years or so. Because it's going to be interesting to see what, what's going to happen to Ocon in that team. But yeah, so we'll we'll move on from uh, move on from that and we'll get into another C grade. I'm personally surprised to see him as a C, to be honest. Um, I gave him a B per grade personally, but Sebastian Vettel and Tom Downey, I think I think he's probably had more press this year for his off track I don't want to say antics because a lot of it had very serious messages behind it of course his, his, his extracurricular t- activities if you c- can call it that when it comes to the environment and LGBT rights of course but in the car of Aston Martin it's it's been a slightly disappointing year for him only just because mainly because of the car to be honest and also 
because of that disqualification in Hungary too. I'm 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 still yeah I'm I'm still um yeah I'm still thinking about that one as I'm sure he is. So how how do you how do you see his season in uh, 2021? Uh, Vettel had a very, very up and down 2021 season. He has some real highs. You know, he got Aston Martin's first podium in F1 as a constructor. I can't remember if it was the first ever or the first since 1950 or whenever it was in Azerbaijan. And he he capitalised on a situation and drove really well to hold off uh, whoever was hunting him down in Hungary, only to be disqualified on a technicality. But rules are rules, aren't they? You know, I I don't necessarily agree with it, but there is a reason they need to take the amount of fuel. It's also six months ago. But he also had some pretty poor performances this year. For as many highs there were, there were just as many lows and then nondescript races this year. I mean, you know, you're not getting out of Q1 in Saudi Arabia, you know, just, just some poor performances in various races and non-points finishes galore. Uh, like you said, the car didn't help because Aston Martin didn't adapt to the change in slight change in regulation for 2021. And I do wonder, hope, pray that they've thrown more resources out 2022, which I think they said they were doing after a while. But Vettel this year, when I say this, I mean 2021, obviously, like you alluded to, I think he's been recognised almost more for his off-track antics and I say antics, I mean that in a positive sense. You know, I'm, again, I'm not going to go through them because I don't want to turn it into that kind of discussion. But I don't know if we'll see him win a race or anything again. I think in Assassin pull out like a brawn in 2022, I don't think we're going to see that. Vettel, he's changed a lot of people's opinions over the last few years because not that many people used to like him. I didn't used to like him, but I have actually grown to quite like him. He's just... I think he's just sort of like winding down his career. And it's, if you think back to a decade ago when he had just won his second title on the bounce, that was going to be four with Red Bull. You know, it's funny how wins change and how things change. And he'll see it this year. I, I think he only had a two year contract with Aston anyway. So if, if he has, you know, a particularly torrid time in 2022, I wouldn't be surprised if we see him off. Uh... I don't know. I mean, I think he loves Formula One at the end of the day, but it also depends on there's two parties in that at the end of the day. If Aston Martin don't want to keep him, they won't. But I also think he's going to keep beating Lance Stroll at least. And I think well, that's, that's the minimum. Well, it's, it's not hard. You're right. It's not, it's not particularly hard. But at the end of the day, he's be, if he's beating his teammate, then, you know, that's yeah. all you can really ask him. That's the minimum you can do to keep your contract, I think, in my opinion. There's more factors, of course, than that. That's not just the, that's not the be all and end all. But, you know, I, I think I think we'll see him in F1 for a good few years. Yeah, I think he's gonna get. I think he's gonna be better next year. I think he's gonna I be better, so. and the, as will the car as well. I also think. So we'll see. It's all speculation, at the end of the day. we've not even seen any car reveals yet. But we'll do. We'll cover them, of course, just like we did last year. But we've got a, we've got at least a month or so to go before that. So next up, we have. Uh, also in the C category, we have Valtteri Bottas. Uh, now, Tom Downey's called uh, Valtteri Bottas shit, but what does uh, Tom Horrocks think of his 2021 season? The reason Mercedes won the Constructors' Championship. Still not good enough, but, you know, f- for me, <laughs> over the course of the season, over 22 races I think we had, for me, he over over those grade out of 10 races he got one more point than Sergio Perez over the course of 22 races in my grading system not on the uh, not on the championship table but again he finished third in the championship as well so for me he's done a better job out of the two number two drivers I did have him as a C as well he was a C minus he was like the bottom end of the C category but because uh, it just still despite that still wasn't good enough I don't think he's as bad as people are making out because although he was nowhere near his races, uh, nowhere near his teammate in races, he was closer than than Perez was on on flat out pace, on qualifying pace and on race pace. He did outdo Perez in that sense. And that's kind of all he needed to do. He had some bad luck with reliability, a lot of bad luck. And he would have been a comfortable, comfortable third place if uh, if that was the case. And this was in a, a car that over the course of the season was the second best. You you look at the, the races where Red Bull were quicker, there was ones where they were very even, you couldn't really you couldn't really put anything between them. And then there were races where Red Bull were just dominant. And there were other races where Mercedes were dominant. But again, over the course of the season, I think the Red Bull just shaded it over Mercedes and yet he still managed to come ahead of Perez. So he can't be terrible if he's done like if he's done that. 
he did make a few errors and he and he did go missing in races too often but overall if you take away his his unreliability he's done a solid job and he's for me he's justified Mercedes deli- um, decision to re-sign him just I think probably with with uh, Russell in that team it's an unstable unstabilizing element and there's some issues in there as well I, I just think that potentially Bottas you know when he got his when he got his contract with Alfa Romeo, he did seem to up his pace a little bit. He won a race and he showed he showed strength. You know, he when he was looking quick, say in Russia, he would look like he was nailed on pole position in that race. We'll never know if he was gonna if he was gonna beat Norris, but uh, end up putting putting right to the back. You know, knowing going into that, he was going to be put right to the back. I just feel for him. I think he's he's had a bad run of it this year, but you know that is down to his overall pace just not being there. He was never a, a match for Lewis Hamilton. They, you know, they gave him a chance in the first couple of races of the season. He did absolutely nothing to help Lewis Hamilton's championship season. You look at, I think, was it Spain where he just didn't get out of his way? Uh, and there was another race. I can't remember which one it was now, but there was another race when he was he he was very slow to let Lewis by uh, when Lewis was coming through on a different strategy. So. It's overall, you know, Perez was the number two from the start of the season this year, um, whereas Bottas was not. So that's kind of played into that as well. So, yeah, I think Seagrade is, is just about right for him, to be honest. I think he's done just enough to, to keep, to keep you know, justify his position in that team for this season. But, yeah, the right decision to move on. Yeah, the, the thing with Bottas as well is it's been another season where he's only won one race to compared to Hamilton's what, nine race wins or something like that. It, it's... It's chalk and cheese. It's it's a ridiculous difference between the two of them. And the reason why, personally, I graded Perez as a bit higher, really, and we've graded him overall probably higher, is the fact that it's his first season in that Red Bull. And, you know, this was Bottas's fifth and final season, isn't it, Mercedes? So there's a big difference there. You know, it, it, might, it might not make too much sense, but in my, in my head, at least, um, you know, Perez really helped Max Verstappen, not just in the final race, but in the throughout the season, really helped um, Max Verstappen win the drivers' championship. Bottas, he did obviously help Mercedes win the constructors' championship. But I don't think he really helped Hamilton win the drivers. Like, where was he in Abu Dhabi? In, in Russia, he just let Verstappen past. In Spain, like you said, Tom, he blocked Hamilton. He wouldn't let him pass at all for ages. He had to probably fight. I mean, yeah, Hamilton eventually won the race, but it didn't. Did not help at all. And if he didn't win the race, I think uh, there would have been some severe discussions, some severe table smashing and headphone throwing in the Mercedes debrief after that. But yeah, so um, yeah, not not the greatest season by any means for Bottas. Not disastrous. Mercedes still constructs his championship winners this year. They've won five in a row because in part of Bottas, you know, at a time there. So it's five out of five for Bottas and constructors. Uh, championship turns while for a while he's been at Mercedes, but that's that's the most positive view you can take of it, really. And it makes sense why Russell is in the car for next year alongside Hamilton at Mercedes. So we'll, and we'll go to our final C grade. This is in no particular order, by the way, other than the gradings. We don't think that uh, Bottas was better than Vettel, for example, or anything like that. It's just you know, it's just a C grade. So the, the last C grade overall that we've got. Just scraping in there, really. I think there's quite a few Ds in there as well. But Nicholas Latifi from Williams. And Owen, you know, he got his first points for Williams this year. He helped Williams to eighth overall in the Constructors as well. And to be honest with you, I think I think he's had a fairly solid year. I mean, when your teammates George Russell, it's very, very hard to match that. At the end of the day, he, he did have some good performances this year. Oh, I disagree. <laughs> Well, what did you what did you give him overall? I, I gave him a D. Um, you gave him a D. Okay, I gave him a D because he's I don't, he's got under half the points of his uh, under half the points of his teammate, who is George Russell, and and uh, and is incredibly quick. And you can tell that Latifi just isn't on the same level, which is you know sort of unfortunate for him. But he's you know if not for Hungary, his highest points finish would have come in Belgium. You know, and I I just. I just sit there and I go. He just doesn't set the world alight. He's he's fine, like he's absolutely fine. But he's one of those drivers that you think would, like you know, in, in twenty or thirty years, will you you won't remember Nicholas Latifi with the greatest one in the world. I've got nothing against him personally, but you just won't remember him. He doesn't set the world alight. He, he's not. I don't think he's going to move up, you know, into a into a uh, you know into a better team I don't think that's on the cards for him I think Williams is sort of the place where he's going to see his career I think his best chance of um, better results is, is is a better Williams car for next year you know it, it, luckily he doesn't put himself in too much trouble and he hasn't this year as far as I know as far as I can remember really but you know apart from that he's also not sort of done anything 
particularly exciting either. And and maybe that's his maybe that's his issue. Maybe he doesn't he doesn't put his nose into or or, or you know maybe. D- but by being that very clean driver, he doesn't really get himself into trouble and picking up the odd uh, points result here and there. He, he's stopping himself from being able to achieve so so many better positions. You know, I, I just he doesn't do anything for me really, and and I, and I, I I'm surprised that he's got a, a, a sort of rating as high as he has. To be honest, there's, there's two sides of this for me. It, it's a second year of Formula One. I feel like he's improved over last year. I, I don't think he was particularly bad in 2020. I don't think he was particularly good either. I feel like he's improved a bit this year, just gone. So that that's why I personally gave him a scene. Why, why probably quite a few other people did as well. It is. I mean, it's an easy comparison to make because they're both Canadian. But I think Lance Stroll and Nicholas Tifi, they, apart from very rare occasions, they, they don't really do anything particularly special. But at the same time, they usually bring the car home, and at least they do that, you know. And again both probably in their seats because of their <laughs> rich dads at the end of the day but I don't think he's had a particularly bad year at all um, and most of us have gone with that as well uh, but if you've got some some hot takes about these drivers just just let us know tweet us at F1 Chronicle or say in the um, or leave a comment in the YouTube uh, video as well and just let us know what you think about our grades and stuff whether you agree or disagree we're all we're always up for a discussion um, so yeah, now we're going to move on to the Bs, the guys that have done above average. Let's just say that's the easiest way to say it. And we've got four of these in total, and we've mentioned them a few times already. But the next next one is Sergio Perez, Sergio Checo Perez, in his first year at Red Bull. Tom Downey, I think he took again like a lot of drivers who changed teams. He took a bit of time getting used to the Red Bull car, but he, in the end, he played a pivotal role in getting Red Bull their first driver's championship in eight years. And it's it's going to be interesting to see how he gets on next year. And of course, as well, he has his first win for Red Bull under his belt as well after Baku. Yeah, um, I'm fairly certain I gave Perez a B for this year. And I know he doesn't, you know, Tom, you made reference to Bottas and obviously we talked about him earlier. You said Perez came in as as a number two driver. That was clear from the onset, and from and from what we've sort of heard from interviews and all the rest of it, Perez knew that, and Perez was fine with that. And I think that's really played into Red Bull's hands this year. He was obviously lucky to win, I'd say, in Baku because of Hamilton obviously accidentally knocking the brake magic switch and going off in turn one. Otherwise, Hamilton would have had it banged to rights into turn one then Perez would have been second. But alas, he won. And he was still up there when he needed to be. He did have some good qualifying performances. I would say overall, though, qualifying was an area which he does need to improve on. But equally, we've never looked at Checo as being a sort of out-and-out qualifying king. Checo is the kind of guy who you know you can leave on an alternate strategy, who will go out, who will eat so many laps out of tyres. You know, how many times did we see Red Bull do that where they knew they could leave him out, sacrifice his race, which he was fine to do because he knew that was what he was there to do, to allow Max to undercut Mercedes, come back, overtake, all, all, all the rest of it. He did what Red Bull needed him to do. Arguably, he wasn't there all the time and I and and he could have done better in some races. In some races, it was, you know, he he, he wasn't there enough but he was still, or you know, it was it was his first season in a very different setup, in a different environment, in a different type of car. You know, it's it's not you know it's not just that he's gone to a different team. He's gone to a top team. He's gone to a team that was actively competing for the championship. He's gone to a car that's got a very different philosophy because people may or may not say it, but that Red Bull is designed around Verstappen, and why wouldn't it be? And the car does inherently have an unstable rear end because that's how Max likes to drive it. And it did take Perez a while to adapt to it, and we saw that with some of his qualifying pace. But when needed, my God, did he have some titanic battles with Hamilton this year, which which allowed him to Max to catch up when he was when he was undercutting him or something. We, you know, look at Abu Dhabi, look at um, uh, where, where did he have a really good battle with him? Turkey. Turkey. And, yeah. Yeah, and, and other places. You know, you know, Max said it himself when, you know, when... Um, in Abu Dhabi, you know, we heard him over the radio, our, our check as a legend. And when Perez uh, went long in Paul Ricard, held up Hamilton, and then Max was able, and then, you know, did what he needed to do there. So in that sense, he had a brilliant season. And 
dare I say it, it seems like the curse of that second Red Bull seat has somewhat been broken. There were times this year when I was watching it and I was just like, hmm, I don't know. But then other times it was, uh, you know, he he did what he needed to do and he, and he, he did overall have a good season, I thought. I totally agree. Yeah, I mean, he's, um, yeah, he, he had some races and some performances, particularly in qualifying where you thought, oh, God, what's happened here? How has this happened? But... On the whole, he, he did make a big difference. He did do, have some great battles with Lewis Hamilton as well, which really helped out Stefan in the championship fight. And the thing is that, like you said as well, he he had a car that was at an unstable rear end, which is probably the exact opposite of how he likes to have a car because he likes to you know preserve his tyres and stuff for as long as possible. So yeah, a, a solid year for Perez and, and his Red Bull. And uh, hopefully next year, He'll, uh, he'll push on from even there and get maybe close the gaps I want to match Stappen, but we'll see how that goes. So next up, we have the guy that is going to be in the, in the top team. Finally, he's going to be in that Mercedes for next year. It's George Russell. He got a big grade from us overall. He got his first podium this year, even though obviously he didn't actually race for it, but he did have an incredible qualifying performance to get it. And he was a key part in getting Williams there, eighth place overall in the Constructors' Championship. So how did you rate George Russell uh, this this year just gone, Tom Horrocks? Uh, it's a definite step up, and he's proven that he, he has the potential to be an elite-level driver. I do think that he hasn't shown the consistency this year that a lot of people were expecting. Uh, the consistency came at the start of the season where Williams were still just nowhere, and it looked like you know another season of the occasional 11th place and an agonising you know, Latifi scraping a point in a crazy race was going to see him finishing behind his teammate again. You know, it's, it's, It looked like something like that was, was going to happen. But, uh, and then you know, we, we saw what happened in Hungary, and then Spa and then that just set the tone for the season but once that once that place was confirmed that eighth place over Alfa Romeo was confirmed with that second place in Spa it's um it, it kind of tailed off and I think that's a bit of a disappointment for me he he did make a few mistakes this year some epic performances some epic qualifying which we know he can do I don't know if that car is just set up to qualify well obviously not because Latifi can't qualify in it but uh, I don't know if, if George Russell sets it up to, to, to qualify well and then hang on in the race which is why he tends to fall back I know that's how Bottas sets his cars up so potentially there may be a little bit in with there and you know the huge stroke of luck in Spa but even if you take that out he still had a decent season but for me you know, he showed some inexperience in Imola when he you know the way he challenged Bottas at a point when you know he didn't need to make that challenge and he certainly didn't need to react the way that he did I know he'd just been involved in a big high speed collision but you know he had to accept his role in in that accident and perhaps he can he can learn from that especially given you know, you know who he was who he was attacking and what team it was in and and you know just at that stage in the race Bottas was a little bit slower yes you know it's, it's racing you've got to go for it but but uh, it's just that the, the aggression of the overtake and then the eventual mistake that led to the collision just just for me showed a little bit of inexperience and just the end of the season was a bit of a red flag for me. You know, it's, if he'd have carried on, you know, grabbing the odd points position here and there, the odd great qualifying performance, perhaps people would be, you know, would be saying, you know, um, what, how much, uh, how much he's going to be challenging Hamilton next year. But all I'm seeing in social media post season, you know, take from that what you will. But all I'm seeing post season is people saying that they've made a mistake signing Russell over Norris. Um, I'm not sure Norris was ever really in the picture to be signed for Mercedes, but I know he's got representation by, um, in some ways, by Toto Wolff. But that doesn't, by any mistake, by any stretch of the imagination, put him as a Mercedes driver. But it's just for me, it, it, to the end of the season, just tailed off. It's like he was phoning it in. It's like he'd he'd. You know, he he's got his contract, so that's job done. He didn't want to put himself at risk in a car, you know, that and he didn't want to go the way of old Bobby Kay, where he, you know, signed for a big team and then gets an injury in a in a car that he shouldn't have been driving and ends up missing out on that big move. And I just kind of it was just a bit worrying. And I just hope the next season he does come out all guns blazing and uh, and 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 does, you know, prove to everyone that he is that that top level driver because he's certainly got the potential and I think you know I I was actually surprised at the end of the season when I when I finished my gradings and I um, and I leveled it all out and, and you know he was actually right up there as uh, in in the B category and you know very close to the A category which I, I was I was a little surprised at given I think just his peaks were so good that that's kind of artificially inflated his uh his his performances. I mean, that lap in Spa where he uh, where he got second place was probably the lap of the season. It was an amazing qualifying performance, and you know, in in that car, in those conditions, on that track, that alone was 
enough to show Mercedes that he is the guy you want in that car. So hopefully just a bit of consistency and a bit more maturity added to the package. And then he's going to be a world championship winning driver in the future. Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, like you said, that lap in Spa was just something else, awful conditions. And we actually did a live commentary of that qualifying session. I first did a live comment of the session. So if you want to get all of our reactions to it as it happened, because we were all just gobsmacked, like, what are we witnessing here? When is the Williams going to slide down the order? But he just never did. <laughs> it was incredible performance by him. As as was Sakiri. I mean, we said it a lot, but Sakiri in 2020, that was yeah, his, his only performance in that Mercedes car, and he absolutely smoked Bottas. So you know, in, on that on that alone, you think he's gonna at least be challenging Hamilton at some races. He's gonna be there, but yeah, it was a good year from overall. Did let off the gas a little bit as as the season curtailed out, but Williams already was already safe ish, pretty much in the constructors. Maybe that played a part, and it definitely would have played a part in the development if they hadn't already stopped it. So it's kind of hard to read, but at the end of the day, on his day. He's magic, George Russell. I can't wait to see him in the top car next year. It's going to be brilliant. So let's move on to the next driver. Let's go with uh, Fernando Alonso back after two years out of the sport, back in Alpine. Owen, how did L plan go? Did it go to plan or in the end was it, or would you maybe expect a little bit more from him in his comeback year? Just a flip side of, I guess it's a flip side of Ocon, so I'm glad I've got both of them, but Fernando Alonso, bearing in mind, you know, he's had a couple of years out. He's done actually a surprisingly good job. And I don't think there was any session where, like any time where you felt he's sort of being a bit lazy here. I think, you know, he came in with the best, of, came back in with the best of intentions. And, you know, maybe that, maybe that's to try and, you know, hope, hope Alpine can, can improve the car and can get, get a championship. But this season, he's, you know, with a little bit of help from the own driver test. You know, he's coming in and got a third place, but that was a bit of a fluke in Qatar. Mm. But the, the fact that he's, you know, still gone and got, you know, some really decent results, you know, a fourth place, a couple of, uh, I think, a, yeah, a few sixth places. You know, he, he's done a really, really bang up job of of consistently being further up the midfield than you'd maybe expect the car to be. And I think that's that's difficult to do, you know, with a couple of years out in a, in a completely different formula that drives completely differently. You know, endurance racing is is completely different. It's a completely different challenge. It's not as relentless as schedule in some ways um, as the Formula One World Championship. And for him to come back in and do what he's done, uh, beat the established teammate, as I said, is I think you know testament enough to the, to why he's to why he's pushing. You know, why he's in the B grades. And I, I think he could probably push an A um, had he had a couple of just a slightly better result here or there. You know, a, cu- a couple of podiums, and then and you're really starting to look at Ocon and go, well, what are we paying you for? Like, why have we just signed you? You know, as I said earlier, it's, you've got a, a guy who's come in. You know, he's pushing. He's pushing. What was it uh, forty years old? He's you know he's no, he's not that far behind Raikkonen, who's had a who's had a, a borderline diabolical season at this point. You know, and he and he's getting podiums and and smashing it. Admittedly, in a better car, but you know, it's it, it says such a lot about who Fernando Alonso is and what he can do and I guess that's the difference that's that extra world championship for you that's what that's what makes a difference and that's why I'm that's why I've put him where he is you know he's I, I think he's done a bang up job yeah I agree I, he's, he's had a very good season to come back like he'll be two years out and to slot back in that Alpine team beat his teammate who has been there for a few years already himself get the podium in Qatar, which is very richly deserved um, to defend like a lion, like he did against Hamilton in Hungary as well. You know, that that's the old Nando. That's the Alonso that we, that we know and love and we love to see back in the sport. I'm looking forward to seeing next year as well. You know, it, it's just great. And the thing is, you can never accuse, you know, wherever the Alpine car is doing, that is the maximum it can do in Alonso's hands. You know, he's always given it 110%, always. And, um, a bit like the next guy on this list as well, which I'm personally surprised to see down in the B car because I, I put him as an A and he, well, I think he was A midway through the season as well. But it, it's Charles Leclerc, Tom Downey. And how do, how do you rate his season? Because obviously he, he didn't get a win. He very nearly won in Silverstone. He's had a couple of pole positions. He's been unlucky at times. But at the same time, he also got beaten by Carlos Sainz over the course of the season. So he's, he's a difficult one to rate in a way. And we just chat what I gave him. I did give him it. <laughs> Just make sure I did indeed give him an A. Sorry, no, that's Carlos Sainz. Who am I looking for? Leclerc. You gave him a B. I did give him a B. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Here most, we go. most people gave him a B, to be fair. I was one of the few that gave yeah. him a B. He, he had a decent season. 
don't get me wrong, and the Ferrari of, of 2021 was an awful lot better than the Ferrari of 2020, as we know they had the iffy engine from 2019, which then caused quite a lot of hangover. However, if you look at, yes, he had two pole positions, but Monaco, he crashed out heavily in qualifying. And let's be fair, Max was going to take pole that race um, because the lap he was on, uh, okay, you know, we can't say for definite, but odds are Max was going to take pole that race and Leclerc would have been P2, maybe P3. Um, still a good qualifying, obviously, very, very good qualifying, especially in his home race. <sighs> yes, he, you could say he was in contention for the win in in Silverstone, but once Hamilton pitted and then uh, and then served his penalty and all the rest of it, he was always going to catch up because that Mercedes was a far superior car to the Ferrari. Um, so he's never realistically going to win. Um, Turkey, yes, he was out in front for a while, but strategy didn't help. And I think we were all expecting him to walk over Carlos Sainz this year, or at least somewhat. You, you know, okay, maybe not walk over about him. walk over. Sainz yeah. has been a very good driver for a long yeah. time. Yeah, okay, not walk over. That's not the right phrase. But I think we were expecting... Him to Leclerc. be overall, yeah. Uh, yeah, and for it to sort of be, like, uh, not significant, but enough, like a sort of sizable gap between the two of them. However, Sainz, for me, was the better Ferrari driver this year. I know Leclerc had two pole positions, but in terms of consistency and over the whole year, I think Sainz was the better driver, hence why I gave him the grade I gave him. Uh, yeah, I mean, Charlie Boy, you know, he... Uh, Again, he had some good races when he was in the point he did help Ferrari get third. But for someone who has been so hyped up and had such a good junior career, you know, winning, I think it was GP3 at the time and then GP2 or F2, I can't remember when they rebranded. But he, but he won back-to-back junior championships um, and then came into uh, F1 in 20. 20- 2018, and then obviously joined Ferrari in 2019, where he had two race wins. He's going to be an F1 for a long time. We know that because he is. You can't not put him in like the upper echelon to the drivers. But I just feel like 2021. I think it's going to be. I think he's going to use it as, as a year where he's going to learn and grow, and probably sort of like mature and develop a bit. So be interesting to see how he gets on next year. Yeah, I'll be interested to see how he gets on next year. I think the fact that he's been beaten by his teammate, I think for the first time in his in his short F1 career, um, I think that will fire him up. I think, yeah, I think Sainz was better this year. I think super, Sainz was absolutely incredible this year. Charles Clare just been a little bit behind him. It's, it wasn't a big gap in the end. It was only five and a half points, which over the course of 22 races is not a lot. I do feel like Leclerc was unlucky at times. Yeah, I mean, you could say about Monaco, you could say that... You know, it was his crash that ultimately did lead to his uh, DNSs, did not start in that race, but he was just on fire. And as and by Jean to get pulled, I mean, again, I think it's, I think Sainz was the one who crashed out in that um, that qualifying session to cause that, but he was still up there. And he's, yeah, so he's an interesting one for sure. It, but I don't think anybody, nobody's going to say he's had a bad season by any stretch, but uh, yeah, I think you're right. I think he's going to use it to fire himself up a bit more. Um, for next year. So it's going to be interesting to see how it gets on in, uh, well, this year now as it is, as we're recording this. So yeah, Leclerc was the last one of our uh, B category. Now we're on to the A's. Three guys in this. We're entering the top five of our grades overall. And we're going to start with Lando Norris, uh, the guy that has beaten his teammates all end up in um, uh, McLaren this year. He was third in the Drivers' Championship for an extended period of this season as well. It did taper off towards the end, he was, I mean, you don't know where you could say he was. I personally think he was unlucky. Some people are saying he made a mistake in Russia not to win that race. Obviously, the car did taper off towards the end of the season as well. But Tom Horrocks, it, it's still been an incredible season for Lando Norris. And he, he's he's emerged as a, I mean, we already knew he was talented, but he's emerged as a really, really top talent this year, I think. 
Yeah, yeah. And um, I mean, I, I didn't personally give him an A. I gave him a B kind of plus. But just to see how close it was, I've been quite harsh. I've only given two drivers A's. No prize for guesses who they were. Uh, and there was only one point in my gradings between uh, Lando Norris and second place. So he was the only one, like he was the highest B grade you could possibly get. But yeah, no, he's he's come out, uh, he set a stall out after stepping out, not something in the shadow of Carlos Sainz because they were very evenly matched at, at McLaren. But, you know, with Ricardo, the... Uh, uh, the the established race winner and the veteran coming into the team, nobody expected him to, to step forward. I think in the same way that Ricardo's start of the season is slightly masked by how well Lando did, I think equally um, it's slightly inflated um, how well he was doing because um, because Ricardo was underachieving as well. So it's a fantastic season for him, but I just look at his overall gradings and, and I see that for me, he, he should have had potentially three pole positions uh, and probably at least two wins if it weren't for small errors that he's he's made. You know, you look at his Imola lap and then, you know, track limits and he would have had pole position. And then you look at Spa, the mistake in qualifying, which put him in the wall. We could have been talking about him getting second place or even potentially a win there because the race wouldn't have taken place. So um, we look there and then you look at Russia, obviously, you know, rolling dice, very much falling to what the team are saying has, has cost him cost him a win there. But he did get a pole position but he's still without that first win. It's a huge step forward and it's a coming of age for him. Uh, but the scary thing is he is still learning. He is still very young. And I, I, I think that, yes, McLaren at times had the third best car of the season, but Ferrari made a big step in that last third. And yes, it looked like he went missing, but you look, he, he picked up three punches in the last four races. Uh, that v- very much dropped him out of contention. He you know, he was potentially in that that podium for Fernando Alonso, without the virtual safety car and without Lando Norris's puncher could potentially have been a podium for him there. And then McLaren are back in that fight, you know, fighting till the last race with Ferrari. So there's, there's still some good performances in there. He had a lot of bad luck in the last part of the season. And I just think that McLaren just dropped off in pace just that little bit. And then with that, a tiny bit of motivation as well, but then to, to sneak ahead of Charles Leclerc in the standings in that last race, phenomenal. You know, I think uh, Charlie Leclerc has got some, Got some amazing talent, and uh, but his year blighted by errors, and Lando Norris potentially could have been even further, bar a few errors. But again, he's not the finished article. He's what, is he the second or third youngest guy on the grid? Maybe he may even be the second youngest guy on the grid behind twenty two. I think anyway, yeah, he's, he's, he is very young. If you look at it this way, he's the same age that Lewis Hamilton was when he came into Formula One. So you look mm. at it that way and you think, you know, he could win the championship next year, given the right car. You know, with the experience he's got now and the maturity that he's shown, you know, you look at the way that he handled losing in Russia. And, yeah, you know, some people will say that that's when his his season tailed off. But that's not really the case at all. He bounced straight back, um, showed good performance, but just had a lot of bad luck in the closing stages. So for me, yeah, phenomenal season. Third best driver of the year for me. But, yeah, he just needs to make that final step next year. And if McLaren give him a car that can that can win races and he's able to hold off a rejuvenated Ricardo in a car that he's had a hand in in designing, then then he's definitely going to reach that elite driver bracket and could potentially end, end Daniel Ricardo's season. So this is absolutely solid performance from him, but I'm just looking forward to seeing what's coming because there's more. There is a lot. There is a lot more to come from Lando Norris. He could easily have another 15 years or so in the sport comfortably at his age. So next next year is going to be another big one for him as well. Quite a few podiums this year. Almost his first win as well. It, it's, it was a fantastic 2021 for him. And another guy that has had a fantastic year, I think myself and Owen were the only ones to give him an A+. I gave him an A+, just because he was stellar, especially in qualifying. It's, of course, Pierre Gasly. And Owen, you know, he may, he may not have got another win this year, but he did everything other than that. The amount of times... That he was better than the rest behind the Red Bulls and the and the and the Mercedes out front was just incredible. In what is a firm midfield car, he showed unbelievable pace in that Alpha Tauri at times. Yeah, I think um, if we look at the uh, just looking at the points, that's what I, you know I'm going by. But you know he's got fifty more points. Uh, was it? Uh, no, wait, one hundred and ten to yeah, one hundred and ten to thirty. He's got he's got three quarters of the points for Al- Alpha Tauri that this year. I think that shows that that tells you everything you need to know about Pierre Gasly's season this year. He's he's absolutely knocked out of the park. In, you know, admittedly, you know, Yuki's a rookie, but you know they filled two cars, and Yuki's no, you know, as we've seen, particularly in Bahrain, he's no slouch. 
Um, you know, the guy's not slow, and Helmut Marco wouldn't have kept in him as long as he as long as he has if he didn't think he was he didn't think he was all right. Pierre Gasly has just, you know, from from a from sort of rockier uh, rockier parts of his of his career has come back and he's just come back to be such a complete driver. Uh, you know, picked up a podium in Azerbaijan. That probably, you know, Lewis Hamilton probably helped there in some ways. Uh, obviously with him going off. But there's just, you know, the, the fourth place is, you know, there's barely a time when he's finished outside, you know, the top seven positions. You know, there's only three or four occasions of that. A couple of retirements, a couple of, you know, quite low down ones. But other than that, it's just, he's just managed to maintain it. And, and I, I not to belabor the point, it's st- like he's still got seventy five percent of the points. It kind of made Yuki look like a like like I say. It's probably contributed to the reason that I've give that the we've I've said that Ricky uh, that Yuki's in F one a, a year too early because Pierre Gasly's just he he looks like a sort of he almost looks like a Barrichello where you can just rely on him to pull out a decent result, uh, and he's just going to be here doing that. You know, if it, if if he can maintain it, you know, this is this makes him sort of it puts him back in the frame for if, if he wanted to move and you know there, there are teams that would would absolutely love to have him because at times there's he's just got that sort of consistency and the, and the actual ability that we thought he'd lost and and it seems he's sort of found his mojo over the year you know after sort of being having having his uh having his lunch handed to him by by Verstappen but yeah it's, it's just He's, he's he's not the driver I thought he was even two years ago, and that and that is saying something. Like you know, he's really come back swinging, and and I, and I I can't wait to see what he does next year. I'm the same, mate. I mean, especially in qualifying as well. I, I can't remember what the start is exactly. I have a 22 race. I think he qualified in the top six something like 16 times. Not even not even the top ten, the top six. You know, four of that six is made up by the Red Bulls and the Mercedes, and. But well, you can't please everybody, can you, Tom Horace? Because you've got a very different opinion about uh, Pierre Gas. I think he's got pretty much A's across the board from everybody, except for you, who gave him a C overall. I definitely did. <laughs> Can you explain that decision? I, I would love to. <laughs> Basically, for me, like he seems to be a qualifying specialist. He just he just seems to go missing in races, and uh, there was a lot of errors in there as well. And there was a lot of bad strategy from Alfatori. But you know, the, it's the not driver his fault, is it? The, the driver does have a have a have a say. And if he if he absolutely thinks that one stopping in a race is the wrong decision, then he should say that. And uh, he just seems like he's setting that car up to qualify high and then and then drop down the field. And uh, I think it's inflated a bit by how bad Sonoda was. Sonoda was the second worst driver on the grid. And then that car for me was the, was at times the third quickest car on the grid on average, probably the, the fourth or fifth, but at least the fifth all season. So it's easier to grade him high, higher because his teammate was so poor in the same way that for me, Mick Schumacher's had a bit of a uh, inflated grade because of his teammates been so poor. But you look at Daniel Ricciardo, terrible season, car very similar to Alfa Tori, probably slightly quicker overall. Ricciardo's beat him over the course of the season despite having a terrible season and he was ahead of him all season as well. You know, people said about what a bad start Ricciardo had to the season, yet Ricciardo was ahead of Gasly for basically that entire period because although Gasly was sticking it up there, he was falling back in races very quickly. So for me, yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll say it, I gave him a C overall. I, he was my eight best driver of the season so sorry uh you can at me if you want but yeah no i didn't i didn't rate him up there in the upper echelons for me he's he's still he's not that elite driver that that we're looking for at the top yet he, he's a good driver don't get me wrong he's a solid driver and he can win races in the right car but i wouldn't i wouldn't put him up there in the elite driver status at all yeah no i, I don't agree with that <laughs> Yeah, Tom, I'm going to at you. He's, Fair enough. <laughs> Pierre Gasly's, they don't give those points away for free, and Pierre Gasly's got more more of them than Aston Martin, Williams, Alfa Romeo, and Haas combined. And bearing in mind, the Ferrari engine got a kick a, a kick up the backside in the middle of the season. The Mercedes engine's one of the fun, one of the most powerful out there. Yeah, but so did, probably... yeah, okay, but so so did Ricardo. And you said about how bad he was. What did you grade him a D? He's got more points than all those teams as well. He was in the McLaren, which. Was, was slightly, yeah, slightly better, yeah. But he had a terrible season. So for me, you know, McLaren was. Let's be fair, the McLaren was more than slightly better. It was don't come at me with better. facts and logic. <laughs> what, I, what I said was still technically correct. Oh, the best kind of correct. <laughs> <laughs> you get out of here with your damn reasoning. <laughs> <laughs> it's my opinion. It's my opinion at the end of the day, and I've never been a Pierre Gasly fan, so potentially I'm I, I'm being slightly biased in that. But mm. that's that's my that's my opinion, and I've and I have based that on 
re-watching all the races to try and avoid recency bias and that's what it's come up with so that's based on my gradings obviously so that's uh, you know you can take from that what you will but you know everyone's got a different opinion and as long as we're you know we're nice about it and we don't like be abusive towards each other then I mean, that's, that's fine it's fine to have different opinions I mean your opinion is wrong but we'll gloss over <laughs> Everyone does. You beat me to that. I was going to say that, Tom Danny. <laughs> Literally. I mean, we're not, we're not going to leave at the point. We're not going to debate about it too much. But no, for me, no. I don't agree with the dropping back in races thing because, you know, sixth in Monaco, third in Azerbaijan. I don't think you can use Monaco as an example they, for dropping back. Uh, no, no, but these are, not these back, are solid, sorry, that's, these are solid points. These are solid points at the end of the day. Fourth in the Netherlands, uh, fourth in Mexico, fifth in Abu Dhabi, sixth in Saudi Arabia. And you can, I, I know, because I did not have a good season by any stretch, but he absolutely obliterated him. 80% of the points nearly, like Owen was saying, 75% of the points, whatever it was for Alpha Alpha Tower. That's got to be the biggest margin of any team for probably a good while, for a good amount of seasons. I can't think of the last time when he was that one-sided in a team for the points. Um, I'm sure someone in the comments will be able to tell me who that is, but I think it's been a very long time. Well, yeah, actually, ironically, it might be Pierre Gasly and Max Verstappen for their half season together at Red Bull. I think that might oh, be, no. that's probably it. But anyway, I know that, by, the by. by the by, so yeah, again, let us know your opinions about Pierre yeah, Gasly. We've got some different takes on it on our, on our four man panel today for, for that one. Um, and now we'll get to the final, uh, the final A grade of our uh, of our uh, of our gradings here. It's Carlos Sainz, the guy that I think all four people on the season review gave the best driver of the season to, but he, he's ended up with an A, which is very good by by you know, by all standards, of course. Uh, the only man to finish every race of the season. He almost scored points in every race of the season as well. 11th place twice in Portugal and in, uh, in France. But other than that, he was in the points every single time. Tom Downey, it was a very, very good start to life for the smooth operator at Ferrari this year. Yeah, I didn't expect signs to be as good as he was. I've always liked him. I've always rated him. Um, I think because he's always been the sort of like, not so much plucky underdog, but he's always sort of flown a little bit under the radar. Um, and being Welsh, we we love an underdog story, right? You know, it's inherently in our nature. So when he came to Ferrari and, and, and everyone was, well, it, it started when he moved to McLaren, really. Um, and then, you know, and then he started really building a name for himself, especially with this bromance with Lando, even if Netflix didn't quite get that. When he moved to Ferrari, I was quietly optimistic. I am a bit concerned that Fry may be using him to keep that seat warm. We'll see what happens with Schumacher. But I think it's more than fair to say that Sainz has done, um, done more than enough to justify his seat this year. And... And to also justify Ferrari keeping him on for I, I would I would say years to come. You know, he I can't remember who came out on top in the qualifying battle between him and Leclerc, but he had a very Carlos signed season. And when I say that, I mean if you look at the times he got a podium, there was a, there was always a story overshadowing him. So Abu Dhabi, obviously the title fight, got a podium. Um Russia, he snuck onto the podium, but you know, you know, you know. <laughs> look at what happened in that race. And he's just, he's just had a really, really, really solid season. I was a bit worried at the start because I think it was in Imola he went off and he was, he made a couple of sort of, a couple of slight errors and stuff. And and it almost seemed like he was trying to overdrive the car. But he's, you know, he sort of honed it in. He's, he's got used to it, and he's, he's really proven his worth. He's a better driver, I think, than people give than people give him credit for. And now that he's in a team with as much heritage and history as Ferrari, I think people are looking at him and going, "Okay, that guy is actually pretty damn good." You know, because you don't just luck into a seat in Ferrari, regardless of where they are on on the grid. You know, because obviously they're on a you know, they're in a sort of bit of a rebuild mission at the moment. So he's earned that seat, and he's had a damn good season. And if you ask me. He's earned the rights to that seat for years to come. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I can see him. Be, I know he's moved around a lot, obviously. But I can see him being at Ferrari for quite some time. But at the end of the day, a bit like his hero Fernando Alonso, you put him in any car, the guy just—he's just, just quick. He's amazing. He's put in some incredible performances. 
I don't know why, but I mean, he's joked about it, I think, uh, in interviews. Like, he always seems to get podiums and nobody seems to notice it. It's the most bizarre thing. He's always overshadowed by somebody. But at the end of the day, all, all of his performances this year, pretty much, he's he's always done the best he can in that car. Even when the car's not been that great, even when they struggle with tyres like they did at France, he, he still beat his teammate. He still beat Leclerc and he beat Leclerc over the course of the season as well. So... It's it's been an incredible you know start to life for him at Ferrari. And if Ferrari do have a title challenging car this year, which is it's very possible, you never know with the changing regulations, don't rule out Carlos Sainz. Don't rule him out. He could he could be in there for a championship. Who knows? But yeah, so down to the last two, of course, of course, it was the two title challengers, both getting the highest grade overall, getting an A plus overall. Sir Lewis Hamilton, Max Verstappen. We've covered this battle throughout the entire season. It's been incredible. It's been fantastic. It's been exactly what the sports needed. It's produced one of the best seasons I can remember in Formula One history. It's been amazing to watch all the way through. And at the end of the day, they are the two standout performances. It's brilliant. And yeah, I can't even remember who's next. I've got to go into that ramble, but I'll go to, I'll go to Tom Horrocks. I mean, how good have Hamilton and Verstappen been this year? Because there has been times throughout this season where they've been half a minute, sometimes even a minute ahead of everybody else. They have just been in an absolute league of their own. Yeah. I mean, what can you say about those two that hasn't already been said? I'm going to try and find something negative and I'm, I'm sure I can. Uh, so, I mean, for me, I didn't give anyone an A plus because those two were going at it so hard this year. They both made more mistakes this year than they have done in the previous few years combined. Um, so uh, the only blights for Hamilton, you know, Monaco, Baku, Belgium, you know, not you know, finishing behind George Russell uh, in qualifying was a bit of a you know, a bit of an embarrassment from there. Monica obviously just going missing, and really that that's kind of it. And I, I still think that the Silverstone issue was, was a racing incident. He got the penalty, fine, you know, but it, it was it was only a minor a minor infringement for me with a big consequence. Um, and then with with Max Verstappen, yeah, he made a few early season errors, and the biggest blight on his season was his performance in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia for me, that's I, I know on the season review I, I put Carlos Sainz as my best driver but looking back at the whole season um, I did I did just shade it Lewis ahead of Max just basically because of that Saudi Arabian Grand Prix performance it was uh, it was a really really disappointing performance from Verstappen and just showed a very very ugly side of, of what potentially you know could come from him but fortunately that didn't transpire and he covered himself in glory in Abu Dhabi in the way he conducted himself and uh, but it was just you know he was both drivers were relentlessly consistent but just these tiny errors in a couple of races you know Imola we saw as well from Lewis another a, a mistake there which he was very lucky with and uh, so it, it was just just a phenomenal season like you say best one that I can remember ever um, so I think it's certainly in my lifetime, potentially ever. So yeah, I echo everything you said about those two. Phenomenal performance all round from both of them. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, we had Bottas win a race, we had Perez win a race, we had Ocon win a race, and Ricardo win a race. Just those guys. I, I think other than that, Hamilton have a and won every single race. They were absolutely in a league of their own. Yes, of course, they were in the two best cars. Let's not get let's not be around the bush when it comes to that. But just the, the level they were at, the fact that I think Verstappen, every single race, every single race that he finished, it's side from Hungary. I think he was first and second in every single one of them. Um, it's just yeah, he they, they were both incredible this year, Owen, weren't they? I mean. Both from, I think they egged each other on. I think they raised each other's games. Certainly, Hamilton has said how he raised the bar this year. That's just gone on to deal with Verstappen, and it was Titanic. And he didn't know which way it was going to go until literally the last few laps, of course, of the season. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I don't think we're going to see it's like before. You know, Duff, I think I've said previously that you know I've seen championship battles in the past go get, get this ugly and get this sort of one way or the other and be and be on a knife edge going into the into the final race. And, but I, I didn't think I'd see it this soon. Um, I'll be honest. I, I thought I'd have to wait years. I, th- I thought I'd be thirty before I saw something like this um, happen. You know, and I, I do agree. They they gave away more wins than I've ever seen either of them give away. You know, when it wasn't o- over the course of the season. You know, Lewis will be kicking himself for Azerbaijan. Absolutely kicking himself. You know, Max will be sort of thinking, you know, with Italy, you know, if I just waited, I might, what could have been maybe in Italy instead? You know, both both times they threw away points. You know, there, there's so many so many areas where they could have done so much, sort of they, they both could have done, done better. But, and yet, 
you know, where, where I'm, I'm nitpicking here to find holes in in their performances because what they did was so, you know, so ridiculous. You go, let, let's you look at Brazil and t- Lewis taking 25 places, and then I, I don't think anyone can shake a stick at um, at the performance by Max in uh, in sorry in the Netherlands because it just th- there was nothing that Mercedes could. Yeah, it was a downturn in Mercedes' performance, but it was just nothing that they could do, and they just walked away with it. You know, this is one for the ages. This is one of those ones that you know we'll be we'll be talking about that, that will sort of go down in history as one of those legendary seasons. You know, I th- I, I, I to 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 try and say who who was better out of these two. I don't think you can. I think it, it's just it's just the way that the, the sort of cookie has crumbled on it. The, the best thing for me though is that at the end, you know, after you know, you can be as annoyed as you want about the FIA um, and how they conducted that last those last few laps of Abu Dhabi and I am, but the fact that both of them, but you know, both parties were in the pad, uh, sorry, in part for just, you know, clearly the, the greatest amount of respect it didn't, it didn't get as ugly as it could have been. You know, we had that with a small flash in Saudi Arabia, but beyond that, it didn't get as ugly as it could have been that you know, we, we've seen it get nasty before. And you never really felt that that was the case. Once the season was over, it was very sort of, we'll go back and do it next year. And I think that's that's something to be commended, and I, I think it says a lot about them that they both came to that final conclusion. You know, this is their neck and neck, basically. Their neck and neck as as they went into the final race. Yeah, it was it was literally neck and neck. They were level on points going to the final race. Of course, it, it it was just an incredible season from the bar. I know we keep saying it, but it's true. It it, it was something else, and we should feel really privileged to have witnessed it throughout these last nine, ten months or whatever it was of the season. You know, it was it was something else. It really was. Of course, at times both drivers made mistakes, but that's only because they were just pushing each other to the absolute limit and beyond at times, and that's what happened. And it, it was it was just incredible. You knew straight from, straight away from the start of the season that it was going to be a big scrap between them, between Mercedes and Red Bull as well. And yeah, this there were some unbelievable performances in there. I mean, the Verstappen winning three in a row between France, Austria, and Styria. You know, he was untouchable during that run. Hamilton coming back from last on the grid and a five-place grid penalty in Brazil. 25 overtakes, whatever he pulled off, just on another level. And Abu Dhabi was untouchable, of course, as well until the very last stage of it. You know, and overall, you just have to commend them. You just have to commend what they've done. And yeah, it, it's, been, it's been an incredible season to see them do this. I mean, Tom Downey, is there anything else you want to add to all that? Uh, I don't think there's much that really needs to be added, to be honest. It's been, you know, I just want to echo what we've all already said. It has been the best season of Formula One I have ever watched. And yes, you know, there may be an element of bias in that because I'm a Max fan. But just to have such a championship battle that got a little bit ugly at times. I I think we can all safely say the worst we saw was Saudi Arabia when things that was when I was like, what on earth do we just witness? But to have the championship fight that we had all season for the drivers to go in to the final race level on points, it is like something from... If it, 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 it was written in a Hollywood film, you would go, oh, this would never happen in real life. The, the, the only thing that would make it even better or sort of like even more Hollywood is if, um, if they'd been level on race wins. You know, both drivers... Excuse me, we're not perfect this season by by any stretch. You know, they both made errors. You know, you know, we mentioned Hamilton in in Baku with, with, with the break magic. That was such an unlucky error, not something that we've ever seen sort of even promoted before. But it was it you know it's such an sort of inconspicuous thing to do. Yeah, it was just been an incredible season. You know, drivers and teams going going out at Hamilton Tong, some team principals perhaps not covering themselves in glory. I'm looking at you, Toto. You know, no, Mikey, no. You know, but uh, all in all, it's been just a scintillating season. You know, you should think back to Bahrain in that first race when it was like, okay, Red Bull are legitimately quick. And Max could have, would have, should have won that race. You know, if he would have done the overtake in a better place and, you know, when he gave the position back, he didn't give it back in the best place. I wonder if that played into the thought process in Saudi Arabia, actually, because obviously when he gave Hamilton the position back, he gave it back on on the back straight. But alas, just what a season. And 
I don't want to sound like one of those fans, but it was nice to see a different driver win. Now, again, I might be biased in saying that because I'm a Max fan, but Hamilton has won so much. It was, It is nice to see a legitimate fight because the last time Hamilton even remotely had any competition like this was 2016. It's been a while. But I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you on that. I, I do think it's nice to see someone else win it, another team win it. Yeah, the team principles at both at the times, Horner and Wolf did not cover themselves in glory multiple times throughout all this. But that's just because everybody was just doing everything they could try and win to try and win. It was it was on another level. And if we have Mercedes and Red Bull again at the top when the regulations change, which is this is very possible, if not a few more teams thrown in there as well next year, it's it's gonna be it's gonna be incredible again. It's just so good to see. So good to see two drivers from different teams fighting it out for for the drivers' championship. First time we had that in nearly ten years. So it was great. It was amazing. And of course, they are our A star performers, our A plus performances um, for twenty twenty one. But yes, that is all the drivers. It's been a bumper podcast this one, of course, because a lot of the, a lot of drivers to get through, a lot of opinions, a lot of whole seasons to get through. Twenty two races, twenty drivers. So yeah. Uh, it's been, it's been a ride for sure. Um, but yes, we are we are also available on the on Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon, Verbal, Omni Studio, Pocket Cast, and the F1 Chronicle website. You can check through all of our 150 plus episodes uh, on on those, and as well as the F1 Chronicle website too, f1chronicle.com. So lads, I will give you a chance to plug your outlets now as well. Start with you, Tom Horrocks. You, of course, part of the Monkey Seat Podcast. What is that, and where can people find it? So we're on a, like a lot of people, we're on a bit of a mid-season break at the moment, but we'll be back very soon with some similar controversial opinions, no doubt. We're on at Monkey Seat Pod uh, on the socials and monkeyseatpod.com is the website. You can catch us on, on all major podcasting platforms. Just search for The Monkey Seat. We're on YouTube as well. We do live stream most of our episodes on YouTube as well. You can come and catch me, me and Carl uh, arguing about Formula One. And then occasionally people like Tom join us and, and George, you've been on it as well before. So yeah, come and join us. Give us a listen. Yep, definitely check those guys out. Of course, they do cover things outside of Formula One as well. Formula E, uh, the Extreme E, uh, the, the support series as well, like F2 and F3, and much more, I'm sure. So yeah, definitely check those guys out. And um, Tom Downey, of course, I've mentioned that you are part of Everything F1, where, of course, you have your own podcast as well. Yes, so I am, as you mentioned, I'm part of Everything F1. Uh, you can find us across all socials. We are at Join EF1. Um, also, we have a Facebook group, which is the Everything F1 Paddock. Uh, we have a YouTube channel, which is Everything F1. Uh, and also our podcast, which is the Everything F1 Podcast, which you can find on Spotify, uh, Amazon, our websites, uh, everythingf1.com. Much like Tom and some others, we have been on a bit of a, a bit of a postseason break, but we will be back soon. Yeah, definitely do check those guys out. Great show. Another one I've been on as well. Uh, always good to get those guys' opinions on things. They did a bumper 2021 20, review as well for the season, which was had a lot of fun listening to that in the gym. Uh, away Medford, although you finished your course, you're not technically graduated yet. Like you said, you've not been to the ceremony, but you are an expert, a master, if you will, of means to do with F1. Hey, I'm employed. No, not employed. I've got, I'm on PhD now. It's all good. Still a oh. student. Yeah, Dr. Right. Medford, incoming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got, I, I actually just had to supersede Jack. That's all I actually wanted. Um, no. Well, you, you'll be the you'll be the beyond the master of engineering. You'll yeah, I'll be, be doctor of engineering. I'll be worse. Doctor of it. It not sound as good though, does it? No, no. I'm done. <laughs> if you'd like to read the the uh, the sort of level of stuff that I'll be submitting to said PhD, make sure you take a uh, take a look at the uh, the meme reviews. I've done one for every single. Almost every single uh, race this season, uh, apart from the ones that are just sort of a bit unsociably timed because I still have to work. So, so you know, we're, we're talking like seven, 17 meme reviews and now they're getting to the point where some of my friends, the only way they experience Formula One is by reading that. There's also, if you want, if you want to get the start of the, the my thoughts on the uh, on the cars at the start of the season, there's also a couple more articles on there of, as well. That as well, we don't don't know what we're going to do for the for the next year's cars, but we'll work something out. But if yeah, you want to have yeah. any a look at those, any more uh, things I've written, uh, just make sure you look at look for me on uh, sportlightpro.com. 
that's the one that's the one yeah definitely check those out I ho- hopefully we'll get some car views and stuff on Spotlight Pro but we'll see we'll see what's going on we don't even have dates for, I don't think we have dates there's, there's no point comparing them like it's just like yeah this one's got ground effect and this one doesn't because it could legally couldn't <laughs> That's true. The cars will be incomparable uh, to the 2021 ones uh, on this year. Very big change in regulations, which should, should spice up the action, no way, and make it a lot more entertaining for the fans and, of course, more overtakes. But let's just see how that all works out. But yeah, we will be back in two weeks' time to take another retrospective look at the 2021 season. I think this time we'll probably look at the best performances. We're given some shout outs to some ones like. Uh, Hamilton in Brazil and stuff like that so yeah we'll take a look at that I think Hamilton and Verstappen will probably dominate that list but yeah we'll uh, we'll let you know all about that when it's out that'll be out in two weeks time all being well so yes thank you very much for joining us lads really do appreciate it as always pleasure as always thank you very much no problem at all and we'll see you in two weeks time until then see you for the next one goodbye <laughs>